You never know what a fortune cookie is going to say inside, do you? It can be pretty off the wall. But a couple of years ago, Jessica and I were at a Chinese restaurant every once in a while, and when we'd walk out with those cookies, we knew that something we were hearing from the back seat uh, was too off the wall to be what was really inside that fortune cookie. For example... We're all reading through uh, what the fortunes are. One day, one kid said, When I find myself in times of trouble, Mother Mary comes to me, speaking words of wisdom. Let it be, let it be. Uh, We knew that wasn't real. This was an observant boy, though. And uh, besides just song lyrics like that, one time we heard something like this. As we were all reading out, we come to him, and he pulls out one that supposedly says, you will live forever in paradise on earth. You know where he'd heard that? Well, Jehovah's Witnesses haven't been to your door very often if you don't know where that comes from. On, on the back of, of just about everything we get from them, you see a picture like that with those words. We're going to look at Second Peter chapter 3 tonight to see what the Bible says about where you might live forever and where you won't. Besides that doctrine, that you could live forever in a paradise on earth, is a doctrine that's common to our denominational friends that says you could live for a thousand years on earth after Jesus comes back in a special kingdom. Besides those two things, even within the brotherhood of Christ today, I think out there near the fringes of this brotherhood, there are people who are saying that heaven is going to be right here on earth. What do you think about that? Is that what your Bible says? When you think about heaven, what do you think? What are the passages and the pictures that come to your mind? When Jesus speaks of heaven, what does he say that's most memorable to you? I think about what he said in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Maybe you do as well. Jesus has begun in the previous chapter getting his disciples ready for him to leave. He's going to be crucified the next day. And he knows that he's not going to be on earth very long after he rises from the dead. He's going to go back whence he came. And he's saying some things that he knows have to be puzzling, even upsetting to his disciples. So in John 14, verses 1 through 3, he says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so... Would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Sometimes when we read about heaven, things are absolutely figurative all the way through. Because heaven is a realm that's not like anything that we've experienced here in this life. Sometimes there's a mixture of things that are figurative and and more literal. Jesus couldn't have been much more forthright with some of the things that he says here in John chapter 14. He says, I am going to prepare a place for you. Jesus was leaving. And where he was going, his disciples could not come at that time. That was part of the discussion as this kept going. But he's going somewhere. And he's going there to prepare a place for them, for us. And he said then in verse 3, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. So Jesus calls it a place. And he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm leaving where you are. I'm going to prepare a place for you. But he says, I'll come again. I'll take you to myself. Where I am, you may be also. That's pretty clear, isn't it? 
Jesus did not say, and I'll come back and stay right here where you are. In this place that you're getting ready for me. That would have been an opposite, wouldn't it? I'm going to prepare a place for you. And I'll come again and take you to myself that where I am you may be also. When all of life is over and our work on earth is done, where are we going to be? And there are really two separate questions. What's going to happen to me when I die? And what's going to happen to me when Jesus comes back? At this time when he says, I'm going to come back, take you to myself. You may be where I am also. Then, where are we going to be forever? In preparation for looking at 2 Peter chapter 3, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter was one of those who was listening that day. Jesus said the things he did in John chapter 14. Peter is one whom the Holy Spirit inspired. And here's something he wrote about what we can look forward to. In 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 5, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. We've got it good as Christians now, but it's only going to get better if we live faithfully to Christ. There is an inheritance, says verse 4, that's imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Where is it? The Bible says it's kept in heaven for you. And verse 5 says that we're being guarded by God's power through faith for this salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. It's in heaven. When Jesus comes back, that curtain is going to be revealed. And salvation has been wonderful here on earth. Salvation from our sins. But salvation from the wrath of God on that day. Instead of getting that, getting this inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, unfading, it's going to be wonderful, but... Note especially, Peter is saying, that is kept in heaven for you. Heaven here is distinguished from where we are now. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. It's not kept under the mattress somewhere here on earth. It's not kept in a safe at home, not in a bank, not in a mini storage, not at Fort Knox. It's kept in heaven for you. Peter believed in heaven, and he didn't believe it was here on earth. Now keep that in mind as we turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. This whole chapter is about the day of the Lord. That's a day that, that goes by several labels in the Bible. The day of the Lord, the day of judgment, the coming of Christ, and many others. Verse 1, Peter says, This is now the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They'll say, Where's the promise of His coming? Ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. And there's a problem. Some people can't see how things would ever be any different than they are right now. There's no coming of Christ to change everything. Verse 5, Peter says, For they deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. 
The world is not like it used to be. Things have not continued as they always were since God created everything. No. The world that then was is no more. And Peter points us back to what happened during the flood and the time of Noah. There were heavens and earth, he says. This earth upon which we stand and the heavens up which we can gaze, the stars and the sun and the moon and all that's there, the world, that was the world of that time, he says. But verse 6, he said that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. And now he says, verse 7, by the same word, the word of God, the assurance of God, the heavens and earth that now exist, the world that we know, are stored up for fire being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Now, if we read no farther, what would you think about the fate of the world on the day of judgment? The world, not the people, but the world as the planet and all its environment in which we live. Sounds like there's going to be a big fire, doesn't there? Well, that's repeated and emphasized as we continue. Verse 8, but do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come, like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar. And the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. I'm reading it again in verse 10. The day of the Lord will come. I've underlined those words, will come, with two lines in my Bible to indicate emphasis. That's at the beginning of this Greek sentence. And in the Greek, words are placed at the beginning often for emphasis. Will come. This day will come. People are saying it's not going to come, but it will come, Peter says. And what's going to happen then? Well, first of all, he says it's going to come like a thief. When we're reading about a fire on the earth, and it getting really hot, we're not talking about slow global warming, are we? Not at all. That day's going to come like a thief, Peter said. He wasn't the first to say that. Jesus had said it. Paul had written about it that way. And when that day comes like a thief, the Bible says in verse 10 that then the heavens will pass away with a roar. A roar. That's the Greek word roizodon. And we're told that's a term that is onomatopoeic. I had to slow down to make sure I could get that out. You know what that is, a word that sounds like the reality it represents, right? Like pop, pow, splat, roizadon. The Bible says that the heavens will pass away with a roar. That word was used in classical Greek of the sound of a bird's wings flying by or of an arrow whizzing through the air. Things like that, making a noise through the air that passes by. You ever heard the the sound of a fire that's consuming something just right quick? That's the picture here. The heavens will pass away with a roar. And the heavenly bodies, or the elements, your Bible might say, will be burned up and dissolved. Now, the heavenly bodies there might be those things that we see up in the sky. Or if elements is the right word, it might be the the very things that everything material are made up of. Either way, they'll be burned up and dissolved. And the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed, says the ESV. Other translations say, again, we'll be burned up. Now, the reason our Bibles say different things there is that there are different words in different Greek manuscripts. 
One of them means burned up. One of them means something like laid bare or exposed. Here's one of those few times in the Bible where it's hard to say exactly what the Bible originally said because those are very different words. But if we keep this in the context, what does it sound like it would say there? I'm reading about a lot of burning. Burning up. And I'm not going to be done reading about burning up as I read some more verses here. I think that's what it means. Now, if it means laid bare, if it means exposed, then in the context it would seem that there's going to be no place for anything to hide. It's all going to be burned up. Now, Jesus said things that ought to cause us to believe this is the fate of the earth. Mark chapter 13, verse 31, as he emphasized the surety of his word, he said, heaven and earth will pass away. My words will never pass away. But Jesus said both of those things are for sure. One is as sure as the other. Heaven and earth will pass away. That's Jesus' plan for this place where we live. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 11, whenever judgment scene is pictured, the Bible says that the earth and sky fled. They served their purpose. We're about to talk about that in just a moment. Verse 11 says, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? Do you have any question what's going to happen to the earth? When you read what Peter says, how many times does he have to say it? In 21st century English, 21st century smart aleckness, you might say, what part of burn don't you understand? He said it time and again. With those complimentary words then, dissolve, melt as they burn. This world was not built to last. The Bible says in verse 13, according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. New earth, new heavens, new heavens and a new earth. Now, when you've been reading all that Peter has said up to this point, What do you think he's saying when he says, we're waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells? Does it strike you that in verse 13, Peter is saying, this earth is going to undergo a renovation. This earth is going to be changed and and made better. You see, that's what all of these theories that I named at the beginning say but I've been reading burn burn burned up melted dissolved as if there's nothing left so then what does Peter mean when he says according to his promise we're waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells well it's not the only time you read a phrase like that new heavens and a new earth in the Bible It had already been used by the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17, and chapter 66, verse 22. I'm not sure ever in the Old Testament, or or not at least often, we're reading much about the very end of time. Most often in the Old Testament, when we're reading about things that sound like the end of the time and, and the day of the Lord that we're reading about here in 2 Peter 3... We're actually reading about the end of things for the Israelites and the fulfillment of things under Christ in this age in which we live, when everything is better. Now, these phrases, new heavens and new earth, are used in Isaiah chapter 65 and and chapter 66. And they certainly mean that things are going to be better than they were for the people of God then. 
But there are some things mixed in if you went back and read those two chapters that say it's still not talking about something as good as what we're looking forward to. That Peter's talking about in, in verse 13. You still read in Isaiah chapter 65 and 66 about things like death. The next time we read about new heavens and new earth in Revelation chapter 21, there's no death there. That's gone. That's left behind. But in all of these cases, the Bible's talking about a, a new environment. You and I don't know anything by experience except heavens that we look up and see and earth. This is, this is all we know. It's the only way you really can communicate with us about an environment and a, and a realm of existence. For that reason, Peter uses this phrase by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We're looking forward to a new heavens and earth, a whole new environment, a wonderful place in which righteousness dwells. Think about that. A new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. We're looking forward after this life, after this world has burned up to a place where only righteousness dwells. Give thought to that. Why is there anything in this world that's bad and unpleasant? Why is there anything that makes life hard and makes it painful? Only because of unrighteousness. Only because of sin. But we look forward to an existence where there won't be any of that. Nobody will be acting that way toward us. And we won't have any inclination like that inside of us. In the new heavens and new earth, only righteousness dwells. That's going to be a new place. It's not going to be this place. Paul in Romans chapter 8 talks about what we look forward to. Our hope is the redemption of our bodies. Something better. Something greater. Something to which existence on this earth can't begin to compare. And in that context, he said the whole creation groans waiting for that. This earth wants to be let go. The whole earth came under a curse whenever Adam and Eve sinned. And things haven't gotten better and better on earth as far as that goes, only worse. The earth wants to be let go. So the Bible says here in 2 Peter chapter 3, it's going to be burned up, it's going to be dissolved, it's going to melt. But according to his promise, verse 13, we're waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Take some time, perhaps, before you go to bed tonight and read from Isaiah chapter 45, verses 18 through 25. That's the place where the prophet said that God did not create the earth to be a waste. He didn't create it in vain, but to be inhabited. He created it for people to live here. But the rest of that portion of your Bible talks about the kinds of choices we make about the way we will live, about whom we will serve, about what we want in life. And the case is that God created the earth to be inhabited and for men to use life on this earth to seek Him. This earth is our training ground. It's the place where we choose what we want forever. The earth will not last forever. Heaven and earth will pass away, Jesus says. It will have served its purpose. And then it's going to be burned up. According to his promise, we're waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Now what's the point of all of this in 2 Peter chapter 3? He's very forthright about 
what's going to happen to this earth and everything that's on it. Well, don't get wrapped up in it then. Same kind of point John was making in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. All these things are going to pass away, but the one who does the will of God abides forever. The point was made in verse 11. Peter said, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God? There's a whole lot more to it than what we see here on this earth. God wants more for us. God wants better for us. He wants us to look forward to it. And that's how we hasten it. In verse 14, then Paul or Peter says, Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord of salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him. As he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters, there are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you're not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Peter talked about the day of the Lord, about the day of judgment, about the coming of Christ to motivate us, to motivate us to live holy, godly lives. Where do you want to be forever? And how do you want things to be forever with you? Well, you're telling God right now, with the decisions that you make and with the actions that you take, on this earth it's not meant to last. It's just our training ground. Where do you want to be forever? What do you want forever? Jesus went to prepare a place for you. And he's coming again so that he can take you to be with him, with he himself, to be with him there always. In an environment that could only be called a new heavens, a new earth, it's not like anything that we've experienced here. Is that what you want? Is that how you want things to be? And show God by the way that you live. Show him by, first of all, obeying his gospel, receiving Jesus, believing in him, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith, and being baptized. Peter said in 1 Peter 3.21 that baptism now will save you. Not as the washing away of the filth of the flesh, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus is already risen from the dead. He wants to raise you from the dead to live with him in that wonderful new heavens and new earth. He wants you to be diligent to come see him. He wants you to be growing in his grace and his knowledge. Are you ready to give him the glory with your life tonight? We want to assist you. We want to go to heaven together. Can we help you? Come while we stand and sing together.